Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back. I think this is the first time I've missed two Sundays in a row since I've been serving here. Usually I try and keep it to one. That was the intention, but I caught sick with something, and whatever it was, it's best not to share it. You know what I mean? Um, so I do have a letter of encouragement to share with you all this morning. This is from World Missionary Press. It says to the Country Church congregants, thank you for having a heart of compassion and giving of your resources to further the kingdom of God. Because of your contributions, more people will have access to the transforming power of the word of God in their language. You are such a blessing and your gift is an answer to prayer for those who are spiritually hungry. God bless you. I prayed for you. I was wondering if your church has any prayer requests. If so, please contact us at such and such a number. You can let me know and I can contact, or maybe I'll leave this downstairs for you to read. It says, have a blessed day, Melissa S., Partner Communications Associate. Very nice. So we'll look at our uh, bulletin this morning. Do take note, August 28th, we have our second church picnic, uh, Potawatomi Wildlife Park, morning worship service at 10.30 a.m. A summer fest is coming up August 13, and there are opportunities to help um, serve in that area. Uh, one that I think we were talking about on the outreach committee and I didn't inform Barb, so it's probably not on this list, but we'll need somebody to help with handing out tickets at that time. We're going to have our own um, set up for the church there, and we'll do some uh, games. The Blues are very probably going to do a puppet show, and this will be in conjunction with the Good News Caboose that Steve is doing as well. So this should be exciting. There will be a lot of children's uh, focused outreach from us to the community. So... Very, very good opportunity. We could use some help with somebody to hand out tickets. They are just to let people know what's going on and what the timing will be of different events, because it will only be at certain periods that we do the puppet show and that we do the uh, Good News Caboose showings. Uh, preschool is starting up very soon. I think we're three Mondays away. Uh, so uh, if you know of anyone with a preschool age child, please have them contact us. And there's opportunity for donations to be made there. And in a bit, uh, Leah will share with you another exciting opportunity for service that we have in partnership with Triton. But with that, I will close us in a, will open us rather, in a word of prayer. I'm out of practice. So long been away. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Uh, thank you, Lord. It is good to gather with the family of God and to worship you together in song, to hear your word spoken to us and be changed. And Lord, my prayer for us today is simply and preeminently that we would grow closer to you. Uh, we need, Lord, more than even just a word of encouragement um, or a practical application. We just need you. And so, Lord, I do pray indeed that our relationship with you would be enhanced. We would pray with you a little bit more love you a little bit more, praise you, and be thankful to you a little bit more uh, because of today than we did before. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Um, it's good to be back as well, and I, I as well as pastor um, had to miss a Sunday for getting sick, but I unfortunately did not get to get over mine as quickly as pastor did. But um Thank you for praying for me. Um, what a blessing it was to be able to go to the conference and to serve by working um, and didn't know I had COVID while I was working. So I'm sorry for the people that I possibly could have shared it with, but um, I had a job to do and I just kept going. But anyways, um, I recovered qu quick enough, I would say. So thank you for praying. But um, what a great week. Over 500 kids got saved um, and what a blessing. So I would exchange getting COVID for kids getting saved any day. So um, and I just want to share one, dad wants me to share a couple Sundays, some things I learned and I'll share a little bit more next week, but I learned a new song, um, over conference and I, I'm going to share it at some point in the next six months or so. But, um, the title of the song was this, if all I have is Jesus, I have all I need. 
And that just kind of has been ringing often through my head a lot, that um, in this day and age, the theme of our conference was rewired, rewire our brain to know that all I need is Jesus. There's so much going on in this world as we go back to school, as we um, embark in new adventures and things that are changing every single day all around us. And it's hard for these kids to know what the truth really is, but truly knowing Jesus and knowing his word and what it means, that's all we need. So um, I'm thankful for that reminder. So that brings me to the point of a ministry opportunity that we have at our church. Um, so Triton does a service project every year. Triton gives back, and they get every kid in the whole entire school involved from preschool all the way up to seniors, and it's a great opportunity to serve. So we have the opportunity to be a part of that blessing. So the sixth graders this year are going to make goodie bags for foster children. So they're trying to do at least 100 bags, 50 bags for um, babies, age and then 50 bags for a little bit older kids so there's plenty of items on the list but we chose two so i chose baby wipes and journals and a journal can be anything it can be a notebook so anything so if we can collect 50 baby wipes and 50 journals um, by the end of august that would be a huge blessing to foster kids and just an opportunity for us to be jesus to the people around us so with that being said, um, please join us as we worship today.
We'll be in uh, Exodus chapter 7, starting verse 14. Now, something that um, Exodus speaks of is the subject of false gods, idols. It's something that maybe the majority of you cannot really relate to. And even having some experience seeing idols and false gods myself, it's something that can be a little hard for me to relate to as well. But I do remember my first time in China, and we, like the day we arrived, as part of keeping us up all day, so when we finally got to bed, we would be so exhausted we would sleep despite the jet lag. We uh, went and saw the Great Wall of China, the Forbidden City, all of this on no sleep. And one of the other things that we saw, though, were some uh, temples in China. And I um, remember more than the images, I remember people who were doing something called cow towing. It's a word I had never heard till I was in China, and it's basically bowing so low you're banging your head against the, the ground as a form of worship. But it felt very old, um, very distant, very strange. A lot of people um, said that you will feel like an oppressive force. I didn't particularly feel that, but I did feel a burden for seeing these people whose language I couldn't communicate at all um, trapped in this idolatry. So I kind of spent that time praying for them. And then at the end of my first uh, trip there, it was just a short-term trip at that point, one of my students gave me as a gift a little gold-painted, um, not real gold, but a gold-painted Buddha. It was probably like about this big, and it had bats crawling all over it, which was some kind of symbol for luck or, or wealth, as, as I understood it. Uh, but that was southern China, and the missions trip there. And then northern China, not so much. You know, China's a little bit like America, and that you go to different parts, the culture is going to be quite different from one place to another. But in southern China, there was a lot of that. I've seen missions videos and heard many stories about India in particular. Uh, it seems, you know, from the videos of stories that I've heard, as if they have a, a temple on every street corner to one or another god, and every little store they have is selling some kind of image that they have created. And I've heard frequent stories of those who have been there of a feeling of oppression and foreboding. Um, walk into Bourbon, you're not going to find that on every street corner, right? So it can be a little hard to relate to. But, you know, I was going to talk about this last Sunday. It's now a little late. It's one day late. But while I was on my trip, Pastor Matthew Cottrell called from the, the, the Pentecostal churches in town, and he told me that he had become aware of, of an event which occurred yesterday, um, July 30th. It was called a metaphysical and artisan market at Bittersweet Haven in Bourbon, had tarot, bone reading, past life regression. I had to look up what past life regression is. It's like, well, isn't regression bad? Um, that's like experiencing these past life visions is, is what it is. Um, the bigger concern that he had was there was being rumored a, a, a secret gathering of self-proclaimed witches uh, who would be directing prayers and activities against believers in the area. Uh, I was not personally concerned, and I testify I had a great day yesterday. Um, I always looked at it as, you know, about the equivalent of praying to the Unicorn King. If somebody wants to pray to the Unicorn King against me, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm not worried about the Unicorn King. But it is a concern because it can rope other people into idolatry and, and other sins. Um, I wouldn't be fearful about it. You, I hope you had a great day yesterday. You, if you, you know, I didn't so much as feel tickled. Um, prayers of witches aren't going to hurt you, so don't, don't get worried about that rumor. But I, I would encourage you know, prayers for anybody who's uh, trapped in that sort of thing, because although we don't see temples on every street corner and people selling um, idols, there are other forms of idolatry, uh, and even a television or a book or even sports or you know, anything can, can become an idol. 
Um, so there are idols and dark spiritual things that, that do happen in America as well. So um, some of this talk of the, the gods is maybe less distant than, than we imagine it to be. Well, Exodus 7, verse 14 uh, to chapter 8, verse 19, I think helps us to see why we shouldn't be afraid of um, any man-made uh, so-called God um, because they do not have power over the one true God. God will humble every false God and those who trust in them. That's the message for today. Let's pray and read what God says to us. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for being a God omniscient, all-powerful, all-hearing, all-knowing, uh, who hears our prayers we bring before you at this time. Lord, we do ask that you help us in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits to hear and receive the truth being spoken to us today. May we richly grow by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, and their ponds, and all their pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. And the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stank, so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug all along the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. So the Lord, speaking through Moses and Aaron, lays things out clearly to Pharaoh. God tells Pharaoh what he wants. He explains how Pharaoh has failed to give the Lord what he wants. And he explains what the consequences are going to be because of his failure of obedience. The way that all of uh, the command is structured is very clear to make it that the Lord is speaking down to Pharaoh that Pharaoh is less than the Lord, and Pharaoh is expected to obey what the Lord is telling him to do. It is the Lord's role to command, Pharaoh's role to obey. Uh, some translations say, listen. It says, you have not listened to me. The, word, the Hebrew word here actually literally does mean listen, so that's closer to the original meaning, but it's uh, the kind of listening where you are acting upon it. You know the difference between listening and hearing. If you've ever been a parent or a teacher of children, you are aware of the difference between hearing and listening. You know, you could tell the child, pick up your toys. You come back and they say, okay, mom. You come back 10 minutes later, all the toys are still there. I mean, they heard you, but they didn't listen. Uh, so the Pharaoh has heard the Lord. He's just not listened. He's set it aside. The Lord is not a threat to me. Uh, I am the one who is in charge in here. 
I don't have to put into application what the Lord is telling me to do. You know, he's heard it, but he's not listening to it. That's the problem. So since Pharaoh seems to think that the Lord has no authority to give him commands, the Lord is going to demonstrate his authority. And in a very targeted and significant uh, line of attack, uh, I found it really interesting looking at some commentaries related to this and finding out uh, some stuff about Egypt to see just how crafted this uh, first plague is that struck Egypt. Uh, According to Bible Knowledge Commentary, there were several gods that were associated with the Nile River. A happy Isis and Kunum, I don't speak Egyptian. Um, These gods were involved in protecting the fish of the Nile River. So they had three different gods for protecting all the little fishies in the river. And then another was Osiris, and they had an interesting belief that the Nile River was his blood. And every year at a certain point, he would be reborn and I guess in the process bleed a whole lot. And that would be why the the Nile River would flood uh, annually. And so, you know, with their belief that the Nile River is his blood of, of a god named Osiris and other gods are responsible for protecting the fish, we, we, we can't mistake the message when he turns it into literal blood to drown and kill all of the fish. You know, it's to say, those gods aren't real. They cannot help you with the judgment that is coming upon you if you do not obey me. Uh, We know the Lord is intentionally doing this in part to exercise judgment on the the so-called gods of Egypt. It actually says in Exodus 12, verse 12, on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. So uh, it is intentional in each of the little plagues that he does here that he is judging one or several of the gods of Egypt. And the means... Killing all the fish via a bloody Nile make the message really clear. The false gods have no power to protect what the Egyptians believed that they could protect. The Lord can actually turn the Nile into blood, not just the mythological idea that they had. He can really do it. Uh, It's less directly stated in the Bible, but I think another saying, because he says, you will know that I am the Lord, and that is his personal name, which means he's self-existent. So he is uh, giving a message of self-existence here. Um, He is the great I am, the one who was, who is, and who is to come. He's not like men or other creatures which have a beginning, a source which they depend upon. He has always been. And so he's told Pharaoh that he's going to do this, that they will know that he is the I am. I am the Lord, the self-existent one. They are dependent upon the Nile River. Uh, That was what Egypt was built around. They needed it to live. Uh, It gave them the water for their own life, for the life of their animals, and for their crops. And he's poisoned it with blood. And the fish have died. By striking the Nile, the Lord is showing them that they are not self-existent like he is. Uh, He exists without need. They have deep needs. And it also shows his power to create something out of nothing. He has created what, you know, in chemical terms, cannot be blood into blood in ways that we we just don't know. We don't know how the Lord did it. Just boom like that, transforms it into blood. He could do that because he is outside the rules of nature, not bound by that he is the I am. Somehow, though, the magicians of Pharaoh managed to also turn the water into blood, or at least something that appears like it. There's no way now to know what they did. I mean, I can imagine, you know, I can imagine ways that it might look like that. Maybe they're like, hey, Pharaoh, turn around for a bit. They're just dumping some blood into the river. Okay, Pharaoh, now you can look. See, behold, the water has become blood. But I don't know. I don't know how they did it. Um... And this was over 3,000 years ago, so we're not going to figure it out now. Um, But they managed to replicate in some manner this miracle. Seven days then passed, verse 25, seven full days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, 
Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. Ugh. You know, some people think frogs a delicacy, but I'll get, the, the Egyptians did not. Put it that way. The frogs shall come up on you and on your people and on all your servants. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals and over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Liar. Moses said to Pharaoh, Be pleased to command me when I plead for you and your servants and for your people, that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. And he said, Tomorrow. Moses said, Be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs shall go away from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. So Moses and Aaron went out from the Lord, and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs as he had agreed with Pharaoh. And the Lord did, according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields. And when they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. And they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So again, this particular plague was purposefully designed to communicate a message. And according to the Bible Knowledge Commentary, once again, the Egyptians in their pantheon, they had a, a goddess named Heket. And she was in the form of a woman with a frog's head. How beautiful. And from her nostrils, it was believed, came the breath of life that animated the bodies of things that were created by her husband, who was named Kanum, from the dust of the earth. And therefore, they had a particular religious observance uh, because she was the, the breather of life into living things. You were not to kill frogs. Uh, they represented her. This plague has put so many frogs into the land that the Egyptians are going to have a very hard time not killing them. Their beds were on the ground, not like our beds. Although some, some of mine and Jenny and mine's travel, we were sleeping in camps, so I guess we were on the ground. But, you know, normal people's beds, they're up high. But in Egypt, they were all on the ground, so if they roll over in their sleep, ugh, <laughs> gonna, gonna feel something a little bit squishy. Uh, they better check very carefully before they cook. They're going to have some frog legs in their bed. Uh, the Egyptians did not think that was a delicacy. Better walk around the house very carefully at night. Or they might get something between their toes. Like some gross squishing going on. Uh, yeah, so they're going to be um, inadvertently disobeying this command not to kill frogs. And they're probably going to be killing a lot of a lot of them. So once again, it's a very purposeful message to say to the Egyptians, Heket's not real and Heket cannot protect you. Pharaoh's response to all of this, I think, reveals something about him. He knows, whether he will admit it or not, that the Lord is God and Heket is not. He knows that he's the ruler over a false religion. He doesn't, he doesn't turn to his uh, sorcerers and say, please plead with Heket that these would go away. He goes to Moses and he says, could you please talk to the Lord for me about this so that the, the frogs will go away? There's an implicit admission there that he knows that the Lord is really the one doing this and the Lord is the one who has the power to, to take it away. There's something, uh, some admission there that he knows his, his religion really can't do anything about it. 
That's why he asked Moses to plead with the Lord instead of petitioning the cat. This judgment came from the Lord. He knows it came from the Lord. And if there was any doubt in his mind about all of that, Moses tells him, uh, let's see, verse 10, be it as you say so that you may know that there was no one like the Lord our God. And then it happens. Uh, So if there had been any doubt left in his mind, then when his prayer is answered and they all go away, he knows that it is the Lord who has set these frogs away. But he hardens his heart. We know now he's making a very deliberate choice to reject the truth and choose evil instead of obedience to the Lord. Now, last week we talked, not last week, last time, last three weeks ago, uh, we talked a little about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. And I, I want to elaborate a little bit more on it here. The first time that Pharaoh's heart was hardened in Exodus 7, uh, verse 14, the Bible is a little ambiguous about who hardened the heart. Um, I think it was probably the Lord, because the Lord says a few verses earlier, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And then verse 14 says, Pharaoh's heart was hardened just as the Lord had said. So it's a little ambiguous, but the weight of the evidence would be in favor of the Lord hardening it that time. But here... And the majority of times, especially early on, it's Pharaoh hardening his own heart. Uh, We don't actually read a definite, clear, um, inarguable occasion of the Lord hardening his heart until chapter 10. So the intersection, why I want to draw this out, just a a, a theological topic that's difficult for people at times, is just that intersection of man's ability to choose, make their own choices, usually termed free will, with God's sovereign ordering of events in history and his sovereignty over the hearts of man, it's been the subject of endless debates, sometimes even literal fights, often heated. Uh, In my eyes, the debate seems to exist because I think people are unable or unwilling to uh, imagine or or admit that both could, could be true, that man can actually have autonomy to choose, while at the same time God can still be completely in control, even to the extent that he's uh, sovereign over other people's hearts. Uh, And I'll admit the two are logically incompatible. I think that's why the debate will continue to exist and has existed for, you know, millennia. If God is over everything, then how can we make our own choices? But if we make our own choices, then how can God be over everything is kind of how it goes. But I think we maybe sell God short if we believe that both cannot be true. Maybe God's sovereignty and wisdom are such and so great and infinite that he can do both at the same time. How is that possible? I don't know, but I'm not sovereign. I'm not the Lord. I think it would take someone who is sovereign to truly understand sovereignty. But anyway, I bring that up because I think the hardening of Pharaoh's heart demonstrates Uh, these two truths working together. They help us to see a little bit how both things can be true. The Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart. The Bible says so. There's no getting around it, no denying it. The Lord is sovereign over Pharaoh's heart. And yet, we also cannot say that Pharaoh did not harden his own heart. uh, Because in these verses, it's very clear. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh wanted his heart to be hardened. Many times the Bible tells us that Pharaoh, in fact, hardened his own heart. So when the Lord does the same, we know that the Lord is not um, superseding over the will of man to put upon man's will something different than he would choose for himself. The Bible teaches that mankind does make their own choices, and yet the Lord is sovereign over everything, including our hearts. We're never going to understand it in this life. Um, It's not a subject I like to debate with people. I think it takes an infinite power to make both true, and if we ever understand it, it will be in heaven. But Exodus is an excellent book that we see a little side of both of these these elements on display. The all-powerful, almighty God, who can't even um, be sovereign over hearts, and yet the free will of Pharaoh and his choices. 
Well, somehow the magicians of Pharaoh, they managed the same or a similar feat with the frogs. Did they have, you know, again, I can imagine, did they have a bunch of frogs in cages? Hey, Pharaoh, turn around for a little bit. Okay, you can look now. Oh, frogs, I don't know. Uh, but was there some genuine occult magic going on here? It, I don't know. Uh, but they manage again to do something that is at least convincing enough that they replicate. But this last one, um, this is the last one that they managed to replicate, and the situation begins to change. Verse 16 to 19. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth, so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So there's several possibilities for the gods which are being judged here. Set was the Egyptian god of the desert, so he's the god of sand. Geb was the god of regular old dirt. Uh, I tried to look up who was the, the god of gnats, couldn't find it. Um, and gnats is actually a rare word, so some translations have lice instead because there's a little bit of debate. You know, it's a small critter, small insect, whatever it is. Found that Kepri was a god of insects, specifically scarabs. Getting a little bit ahead of myself to the next plague, uh, but the Egyptians had different gods for different types of flies. Uh, there was, let's see, Re, or Re, R-E, he was over dog flies. And then there was Uichit, who was over regular old flies. And I have a, I, I forget the name of the fly, but there's a kind of fly, it, did, it didn't exist in West Virginia, but it will bite you here in Indiana. It'll bite your legs and your ankles. It'll bite you in Colorado and California. I have a bone to pick with that one because uh, I, I was never bitten by a fly until I was sitting on a beach in Indiana. I'm like, ah, he just kept biting me. It's some different kind of fly there. Anyway, um, I want to point out, you know, it's, I've wondered before, maybe you've wondered, why doesn't the Bible mention these gods by name? I've would find it interesting if the Bible said, and so Heket was judged, or so Re was judged. Well, as I was studying this, I kind of came to the conclusion, I think there's just so many it would become dull reading. I mean, if they have a God for each type of fly, and, you know, the different kinds of sediment between, you know, whether it is sand or regular old dirt, then, you know, if you've ever read through a genealogy or the listing of the lands, and you thought, man, this is a little bit dry... Imagine how you would feel if it listed all the hundreds of gods of Egypt. So instead, he just simply states, it's over the gods of Egypt that these judgments are about. And at any rate, they're not real. Um, so maybe it's just not to even give them acknowledgement or credit since they're fake things any, anyway. So God's probably doing us a favor. So in this plague and in every plague afterwards, the magicians are not able, um, whatever secret power they had, it is exhausted. Whatever creative thing they can come up with to reproduce a similar effect, they're done. And they've even even his religious officials, Pharaoh's religious officials, are now kind of trying to nudge him, like, "Hey, buddy, we might want to rethink the path we're going on, because I can tell you this is the finger of God. I mean, this is this is people." of a totally different religious system who believed in uh, multiple gods, who were just frankly admitting to their king, we can't do it, but there is a God who is really actually doing this to us. What does Pharaoh do? Harden his heart. Not listening to it. I don't care. I'm not afraid. I am not going to let the people go. Simple application. Uh, God will humble every false god 
and those who trust in them. And so I would encourage us to evaluate our own hearts first and foremost, um, whether there be any false god. Now, your mind might turn at first to say, well, I don't worship Ru, I don't worship Uachit, I never heard about those things before. Yes, but there are any number of manner of things that we could elevate in our life to an unhealthy position to honor it above the Lord. Uh, whether we you know, give an excessive amount of our time to something that is disproportionate to the amount of time we give to the Lord, whether we look at something and say, you know, I love that more than the Lord. Um, a good way, a good way to realize if there is any kind of idol in your heart is if there's anything in the Bible that you're unwilling to do. That is probably going to reveal to you that somewhere there is some kind of idol. You know, if God says, do this, and you say, I will not, hmm, maybe the idol is your self-esteem. Maybe it's the reputation you have before other people. Uh, maybe it's fear of loss of wealth. Maybe your idol has become gold. So I would encourage us, um, as we look at what God is doing powerfully in, in Egypt and how uh, man can't stop him, false gods can't stop him, that we would realize that God is going to humble every kind of false god and those who trust in him. So let us not be those. Uh, another that I would encourage us to do from this is to share with others uh, who are trusting in various false gods. You know, if somebody has not repented and believed the gospel, then they are in idolatry. And they might not be like the, the people I saw in China hitting their heads on the, the floor. It might not be so obvious, but there is something other than the Lord that they are worshiping um, themselves, their prosperity, who knows. Um, we should reach out to them. We don't want to see them humbled under the mighty hand of God. We want to see them uh, delivered like the Israelites ultimately are from their bondage. We would like to see them delivered from bondage as well. And then also I'd encourage us from this just to trust in our sovereign, all-powerful God. There is nothing our God cannot do. You know, our God is so great, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing our God cannot do. Uh, he is uh, unlimited in His power. So we need not fear the machinations of men. Um, we need not fear an all-powerful God is in control, and He will ultimately deliver us, His people, to heaven in time. Let's pray. Dear God, we are amazed at Your power, and ask, Lord, that You help us to uh, evaluate our lives today, coming days, so that we can submit to You as the one true and only God, uh, casting down any idols and instead choosing wholly to worship You, the Lord. God, we are grateful that you are a God who rescues from bondage. And so you are delighted to deliver us from any bondage we might be under uh, in some false God we have created. And you are delighted to deliver our neighbors and our friends and our community as well uh, and reaching out to them that it may occur. God, help us to be a people who reach out on behalf of you to declare the gospel and help people to believe and trust in the only Savior. God, help um, conquer any fear that besets us, knowing that we have on our side um, the great I Am, the self-existent, all-powerful one. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able to, please stand and join us.
last week 